This is the 19th season of Bass Talk Live. BTL is presented by Bass Cat Boats, Strike King Lures, Aftco, Pro Guide Batteries, X Zone Lures, Shoreline Boat and RV Repair, Spro, Gamakatsu, Big Bite Baits, The Bass Tank, Denali Rods, Beatdown Outdoors, and Sunline. BTL, coming at you. Good morning and welcome to another exciting edition of BTL Bass Talk Live, where we are going to talk about bass fishing. Yes, I am not in the studio. I am actually in, I think it's Brewerton, New York, uh, right on the shores of Oneida Lake. Uh, just finished up the Kurt Dove pro bass camp on Oneida. He brought in uh, 28 kids ages. Now there's some like 12 year olds there this year. Now there's a 10 year old there this year, ages 10 to 18, uh, bring a bunch of open EQ guys, uh, MLF invitational guys, uh, Kevin short, uh, former two time elite series champion and open champion. Uh, and then we take the kids out for three days. They do seminars in the evenings and then they have a, uh, a tournament uh, on the final day. So that tournament was yesterday for prize money. So I think it's like the 11th or 12th year that Kurt's done it. He does one uh, every year at Amistad, two at Amistad. And then this year, uh, in the last four years, he's done one at Oneida. So that's what I've been doing. As you can see, lounging in his beautiful back porch. It has been paid for with his angling skill is none other than the one and only fresh off a win uh, on the BPT Jordan Lee, Jordan, thanks for jumping on BTL, a noon edition of BTL, a lunchtime edition of BTL. Yeah, you know, you had to cater to, uh, you know, my child today, obviously. Uh, this was his kind of his downtime, his nap time. So uh, this is why we're doing it at 11 o'clock. So sorry for if, if it's off schedule for you. No, it's all good. Hold on. I got to turn off the air conditioner here. I forgot. I mean, we're in a days in here. We're fancy. Yeah, I, li I like it. I mean, I like your style. I mean, fortunately, I could just turn it off right there. I'm getting ready for ICAST. We have a lot of things to talk about. A, uh, a rousing victory uh, on St. Clair was that two weeks ago now? Yeah, I guess it'd be. I don't even know, man. It's a uh, probably a week and a half. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. And then you're flying out, as am I, to ICAST, uh, yeah. which is the international – oh, I should have looked that up. I used to remember. What is? Do you remember – do you know what it stands for? Honestly, I don't. International something and sport fishing trade show. Yeah, that sounds right. Something like that. International something well, it be sport fish. Well, because it wouldn't it wouldn't be sport fishing because that had the acronym doesn't line up for that, does it? S sport fishing. They just take I passed. I see a uh, yeah. I guess you're right. Well, yeah. There's no, yeah. There's no P in it. I and don't know. Have to look it up. Uh, let's start with the tournament, man. Lake Saint Clair, a uh, place that. I think, well, I mean, maybe some of the rookies hadn't been there, but it, a lot of the former FLW guys had fished there. Yeah. A lot of the Elite Series guys had fished there. You kind of knew what to expect going in. We're at that kind of smallmouth time period frame. Uh, I think I I will always associate Lake St. Clair with you and the Zone Alive episode. Yeah. But did, did, was that brought up a lot during this past week? Um, no, no, not it wasn't brought up a lot, but it's always – it, it, it is always brought up. I mean, that was, uh, yeah, that was a pretty interesting um, episode of, that he did on, on Zone Alive that year and, uh, you know, hooking that sturgeon. How long ago was that now? Was that five been, years ago? It's probably been longer than that, honestly. Um, 2000, I think 17 it was maybe. Se it was 17 or 18. I think it was 17. So, yeah, over five years ago. Do you remember how that went down? So if you weren't talking about it, Zona did Zona Lives for a while. And it was a, having done live uh, with the one-on-ones, which you were a part of with Jeffries. And then uh, I think people take for granted how easily the Bass Pro Tour and the Elite Series make yeah. live television look on 
the internet and on FS1 and stuff because it is a disaster between audio and cell service coverage and video cameras and guys in the boat. But Zona did Zona Live. And uh, you had just had a good Elite Series event on St. Clair, I think, that year, hadn't you? Yeah, I did. And um, I, I remember we just planned on going out after the tournament um, right there to St. Clair. And, you know, so that was – I mean, he was excited about it, obviously. I don't know how long he'd been doing those for. I think it was like his second year. Second year, yeah. And uh, so we were just going to go out to where I'd been fishing and, you know, the day after the tournament – so, you know, we went out there and didn't really know what to expect and, you know, h- hooking up with that massive sturgeon. I just remember, like, setting the hook into it and it just felt like I was hung. And then it started moving around and I'm like, I don't have a clue. I mean, I don't know. I didn't even really think about a sturgeon. But, uh, yeah, fought it forever and lost it right at the boat. Heartbreak and loss. That wasn't really your fault, though. It wasn't Zona monkeying with it at the side of the boat? Well, I mean, dude, it's so big. I mean, it's like, what do you do with the, you know, couple foot long? I mean, I don't even know how big it was. It was bigger than that. It's like I, five or six foot. Yeah. So we, we didn't even have a net. I can't remember if somebody gave us a net. No. Yeah, somebody gave us a net. Yeah, because a, there were like 100 people watching you by the time it was over. There were people. You fought yeah. the thing so long because it, whoa. That thing shouldn't have done that. Yeah, we fought it. We fought it so long, and we had time that everybody was just following us around and talking to us. And you know, I had the 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 cape on, and then the the king the king. I hat. forgot all about that. Yeah, that was that was because uh, he 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 named me the king, or you know, whatever he had a name for me, Jordanius Maximus or something. And so, uh, and he was wearing the gold pants and. You know, he had a chain on, and we were just out there just, you know, goofing off. And But, yeah, somebody gave us a net, and uh, and he tried to scoop it up, and it didn't get in the net, came off, broke my line, and, you know. But it, it was it was, uh, it was pretty – it was entertaining. I remember it was long enough that Zona invited everybody out and, like, told everybody where you were, basically, which yeah. – yeah. See, this is what happens with Newfangled. So, I have a – I have a, uh, it's like a smart stand. Yeah. And like every 30 seconds, it just goes haywire on me. Yeah. It'll probably happen again. It's all right. It's like technology. Yeah. Uh, But I remember he invited everybody out there. And by the end of it, you had a massive gallery of fans rooting and cheering you on as you fight it, fought this thing. And boats had to move out to the side. I, I mean, I remember I was sitting in the studio in Oklahoma and Jeffries and I were drinking beer watching it because it was like an hour and a half long. Yeah. Yeah, it was – I guess it was entertaining. I mean, because you didn't know what was going to happen, right? You didn't know mm-hmm. if, if the surgeon was going to get in the boat. We didn't, you didn't know what we were going to do with it. That would have been really entertaining if – we actually got it in because i mean what what were we going to do with it i mean i guess we're just going to hold it up like a prize winning take pictures of it it looks like a a freaking shark though are you even allowed to take those like out of i don't know that's a uh, that's a good question i don't know water i don't know i don't know we didn't know anything we were just trying to get this thing in have I told you about my sturgeon fish? Because no. it happened here on Oneida. Last year in the open, I hooked something on six-pound test in a net rig. And I remembered it. And I just had a talk with Scott at Lakeside Outfitters about how the sturgeon were making a comeback. It's on the bucket list of things I've always wanted to catch and never have. And uh, I hooked this thing. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to go live. And I'm out on Shackleton in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it's a Shackleton Shoals is like five miles long of just a jumble of humps and gravel and rock and grass. And this is going to be really annoying. I can already tell. I mean, yeah, like that's, that's that's I can tell you're fired up right now. I don't know if there's a way to lock this. Is there a way to lock this? See, then it like locks into place. What if I hit that? We'll see if I can lock that. New in. technology. 
Oh, I know. I mean, you are in a hotel room, so I mean. I know, but it is BTL. I need to have this stuff. This is the first time I've used it. I actually used it on the water with a scalp Palmer for Bass Tank. Anyway, I hooked this thing, so I get the idea. Let's go live because I immediately think sturgeon. And your yeah. your deal's in the back of my mind. So I go live. I yeah. get up to I get up to over 1,000 people watching me live. Half the other competitors are watching me live. Yeah. You know what? There's a real easy way to fix this. Thanks for coming out. I think you're done. Are you gonna be done with this? Are you gonna be done with the smart? There you go. I may be done with the smart. I may be done with the smart sooner rather than later. Yeah. All right. We have that. It's not a great angle, but it'll work. So no, it's we, good. we uh I go live. I've got like a thousand people on. Tom in the instant feedback, he said, Hey, I remember watching that. Uh a couple other people remember watching it and then it tows me over to where upshaw is practicing well i'm room you know buddies with upshaw so i get yeah. the right idea dude two person perspective here so while i'm fighting it i send him an invite to collab on my live and he's got like thirty thousand followers you're thinking so now all of a sudden i've got me the first person angle you know i'm fighting this sturgeon and then Upshaw's following me around on the bottom half of the screen, and I'm live, and I've got 3,000 people watching me fight this thing. Right. Long story short, I get this thing up, and it's a freaking catfish, not a sturgeon, which is not nearly as cool as a sturgeon. Not cool, no. Now, granted, it was probably a lake record catfish. It was a channel cat that was like over 30 pounds and just giant full of eggs. Yeah. But I have never, I mean, we were talking about how I was going to like jump in the water and he was going to take the picture with it what and a, stuff. Kind of like what you guys were doing. Yeah. And it was a freaking jet black channel catfish, about 30 pounds. And as soon as it came up and it was a cat, the viewership went down to like 100. Yeah. Well, so I show up this year and I walk into the tackle shop and Scott goes, planning on catching any sturgeon this year? So that was my, that was my sturgeon story but you got you got catfish yeah so did you catch them in the same general area that you always catch them on st Clair this time around i mean you have what you average like with the two rounds and the other rounds around 23 a day yeah i think they said i think what i read uh i read i i had 90 i had 94 for four days so whatever that average is to probably 20 yeah a little over 23 a day mm -hmm. um so yeah uh no i didn't catch them in the same general area um which i fished there i think this is my fifth tournament there and uh, i've had mixed results you know i've i've uh fished to open there 10 years ago and you know finished mid 100s went back for an elite made a you know got a check uh, went back to the elite and came in fourth, led for a couple of days, missed a cut MLF barely. And, uh, you know, this, this time won, but it, yeah, uh, this was the first time I've actually fished in Canada. Um, okay. Pro yeah. This was the first time I fished in Canada, um, out of all the, out of all the times I actually fished there. Some of that being because of COVID, you weren't allowed to go in Canada the last time or two we've been there, I think. Um, so that, yeah. So I just completely went to, you know, new areas and stuff like that. I di didn't have any too much knowledge over there. Was, was Canada open during practice or did you have to kind of free roll it? Did it open right as the tournament started? Yeah, it, it opened the uh, first day of the tournament. So it was. Uh, so you went over there blind? Yeah, I went over there blind. Uh, well, we, we could go over there in, in practice, but you couldn't make a cast. Your, rod, your rods were supposed to be up. I mean, just – they didn't have to be, I guess, but you couldn't make a cast. But I just had my – there's a bee. I had, I had my rods, you know, in the rod locker the, the whole time. And it, that was tough to, uh, to go over there. That was my mindset going in. I'm doing this. I don't care. I don't care if I come in dead last. I'm going over here and fish. I'm, I'm going to fish over here in the tournament. Um, and, and that's what I did. I mean, 
it was really hard though to go over there even with a you know dropping an aqua view I, I i've never done that before but it's not very easy you're not seeing a big distance mm -hmm. so i mean i was out around trying to look for places where i think they would be but dropping a camera down maybe seeing a smallmouth here and there um but yeah the first day of the term was the first day we could actually make a cast all right, I want to get into this. So the aqua view thing, oh, uh, uh, the, the cat's out of the bag, but the bag is near the cat still. The cat is like three quarters out of the bag. There's like a leg left in the bag. The guys up north, uh, the guys who catch smallmouth, that aqua view has been a lethal weapon for them uh, over the past five plus years. Uh, I know there's some guys that talk a little bit about it. Gussie will talk a little bit about it. The majority of the guys are not talking about the fact that they're dropping really. aqua view cameras down on these smallmouth uh, because you can tell size, you can tell school size, you can tell bottom composition, you can tell the bait fish, the gobies that are around there. Yeah. Uh, especially when you have good light penetration, good clarity. Was the entire field where there are 80 guys with aqua view cameras and little eight inch screens over in Canada dropping on them or was that something kind of sneaky and how did you end up doing that well I, I didn't own an aqua view and I probably would never I mean I didn't realize how many guys use that you know I knew guys did but mm -hmm. I'm always I guess if I see them on active target or sonar or whatever you know and they buy it then I kind of know I don't know. You can kind of get a feel for it, I guess, fishing, but I, I definitely dropping it. I mean, there wasn't that many guys probably with aqua views. I mean, some guys obviously had them, but uh, not being able to fish and you're just randomly kind of dropping it out there. I mean, you can see on St. Clair, but, you know, it, it wasn't. I mean, I'll, I found one place that I really caught fish because of it and probably won the tournament um you know it helped me win the tournament but there wasn't like everybody was over there dropping cameras down and seeing all these small mouse swimming around everywhere uh you could definitely see them but it wasn't wasn't like that i mean it was a pretty big gamble going over there why don't you think guys are complaining online about aqua views but they are live scope like why is I mean, it's, I mean, maybe I haven't seen it, but why have we not seen a Randy block at rant on aqua views right now? I mean, it's a freaking right. actual live camera. Now you can use it in practice, but not during the tournament, right? Yeah. I think you can use it during the, Oh, tournament. you can use it during the tournament too. Yeah. Why have we not seen the, the massive outrage with live HD cameras underwater with yeah. fish actually eating your bait? Where's the magic and mystery of that? I mean, it seems like a, like it's a completely, double whatever that saves. i guess because you can't see on you can't see with the aqua view unless you're in really really clear water so you're talking about the great lakes st lawrence smallmouth fishing i guess that's the only reason because i mean if you could drop it on it just anywhere and see fish i mean i guess it would be different but it just doesn't get utilized a lot you don't see Table a lot yeah, maybe you just don't see a lot of people doing it. I don't know because it is time consuming. It is kind of a hassle to drop it down. I had it at the back and I had it hooked up to my unit. So I would just drop it down and, and just basically just drift and drift across. I mean, it's not easy to really use. Like, Can I mean, you tell which, direct, which way it's facing or is it just a cable down there with the... Well, yeah, you can... Um, so when I when I talked to uh, the guy there at Aquaview, he sent me. I got I got a few things from him, and he sent um, this like fin that goes on the back of the camera, which will actually when you're uh, it, it helps troll like when you're trolling it, um, it'll keep the camera up and it like vibrates. It feels like a, almost like a uh, it feels it feels like a chatterbait down there. So uh, the, the camera stays upright and it's made for trolling. So, um, you know, it, it, it sits up and it, and it, you know, the small mouth, like the ones that I was seeing were actually fall on the camera. Really? So you just yeah. be trolling, you have it set up on your units to where it's like, yeah. and it's just like you're idling, but you've got a live camera down there. It's just murk, 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 small mouth. 
Yeah, you couldn't see. Uh, you couldn't go fast, so you had to. You couldn't. You couldn't even have the. And there's probably a way to do it where you could go fast, add weights, mm-hmm. to it, but it, the camera would rise if you were actually on the big motor. So I was just like literally slow drifting like across stuff just to see like if I could see anything or the grass or trying to get a feel for what was going on. Um, but they would actually follow the camera. It was pretty cool. And, you know, I'd hit a waypoint. And, uh, man, a lot of places like the place I started at, I had probably seven, eight marks there where I was seeing smallmouth. And uh, I only caught one there, you know. So, so mm-hmm. that was kind of weird. But I, I never dropped it down in the tournament. Um, I was tired of looking at that camera. I got you. Uh, your brother's on here talking all sorts of crap. No, is he? Yeah. Uh, I, don't see, I don't see the chat. Hey, I will say uh, Quadlock making a big push in the fishing market. Reaching out, doing all sorts of cool stuff. Good products. I probably need a quad lock stand for the camera. They probably yeah. need something like that that I can do that, that isn't going to go electric on me. Uh, and then also a uh, guy saying that they've been using AquaView for 25 years, especially when ice fishing, that there's a, yeah. a bunch of uh, a bunch of other ways for them, too. It says it slays at ice fishing. Uh, try and catch one outside the spawn with an AquaView. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not dialed in on the off of you game. Like I said, this is my first time, dude. I think there's about like a dozen guys that are, and I've gotten one to talk about it on the show. Yeah, see, so yeah, yeah, I don't know much about it, so I guess like it's, it's a thing. It's a real thing. Like there's guys that are using it that are not talking about it. Yeah, I mean, I really don't care to talk about anything. I don't have. I mean, there's no real secrets anymore. But I, I'll tell you what's cool about the aqua view that i wish i could have dropped where i won the tournament um you could have couldn't you i could have but i didn't i didn't bring it out there um, oh, okay. but it uh just to say what was cool in st Clair is to see the actual bottom and like to see what was on the bottom because there's literally nothing and it's like there it, the you think it's like sand but it's not it's like sand but it's got like moss over the top of it and then there's just like this grass that looks really thick on your sonar like you'd be idling and be like man this grass is thick well you drop a camera down there and it'd be pretty sparse like you know you could you, the fish would swim around in there you could fish it and it wouldn't look fishable on your 2d yeah so it, that was kind of cool to see the bottom um but i mean st Clair is a great place for it and mm-hmm. and, and all those smallmouth lakes I could see. Uh, tournament wise, then you obviously won. You had a big weight. I think if you had combined all four of your days, you're at what, like 95, 96 pounds, something like just shy of 100? It was not, yeah, it was 94. 94. Uh, as a whole, do you think the fishing fans, after seeing all these up north, have become numb to just how impressive a 23 pound bag of smallmouth is? especially after what we've seen out of Ontario and stuff. It just seems like when it first hit 90, you were part of it there on the Elite when when it was like, are we going to hit 100? Is there going to be 100 yeah. pounds? Is there a century belt? And it was like, the Johnsons might do it this year. They might happen this year. And then, uh, you know, obviously uh, Coop went over the 100-pound mark. But I feel like people don't understand how impressive 94 pounds of smallmouth is. Do you feel that too, like people get numb to big bags of smallmouth? I think I think the fans get numb to the just the smallmouth fishing in general. Maybe not the big bags of smallmouth, but just the drop shots and the looking mm-hmm. at the to the screens now. And it's still cool, I'm sure, to watch. Um, and a lot of people probably Jay, not Cooper. Sorry, Jay Shakurik. Oh yeah, I'm sure people get you know like like to watch big smallmouth get caught, but when you're in that open water and there's nothing to like really see. Um, I, I think the fans get more numb to that than maybe the, the weight size. But I mean, yeah, I think the guys who fish there are probably St. Clair and, you know, all these lakes, they, they're still like, wow, he caught, you know, a hundred pounds of smallmouth. Like that's still pretty cool to, 
So how do we remedy that? Is it going different times of the year? Is it just that's how smallmouth are always going to be caught? Because obviously you guys are going to do what you got to do to put the most weight in the boat, regardless of how exciting, quote unquote, it is to the viewers. But is there a way to make the smallmouth fishing tournaments exciting? I think, yeah, I mean, I think if you, one thing would help, which we saw, I think Bassmaster did it this year where you got all the guys' screens on live, like it pops up, you know, they're, they show, they're showing me, and then, you know, my active target um, is on the screen with it, you know, and then you see me talking through, like, you throw over there and you see three go down on it, and you're like, oh, I think he's fixing to get it, you know. Then you set the hook. Yeah, that would make it more, to me, more viewer friendly if you had you know like at least maybe the final day where you had 10 guys where you could you know have it dialed in before the the you know the final day and then you know watching them kind of talk through it i mean i feel like that's probably the best thing for the smallmouth fishing um to make it more viewer friendly i mean that that's a no-brainer to me and I don't really know why they haven't done that yet. I mean, I, I feel like it'd be pretty easy to talk to Lawrence and Garmin and Humminbird and be like, you know, everybody's got the forward facing. You want to sell more, you know, active targets and uh, live scopes and whatever um, Humminbirds is called. You want to sell more of these? I mean, yeah, let's put it on the screens with them, a little bottom shot. I mean, you know, I think that'd be a great idea. It is definitely when you can see the screen, it does make it a lot, a lot more exciting. Yeah. Cause I've got scopers neck right now from being out on, I went out on, uh, on Ontario, which was not off limits because the opens river only. And then Oneida yeah, and I've got the mounts that I can raise up, but you still are looking down, you know, it's not eye level back of the neck peeling like nobody's business. I had to go yeah. hood the last three days because I mean, it, I mean, it's like a different color of my body on the back of the neck. I didn't know skin could get that dark. I'm like, that probably took five years off my life. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of looked like me out there idling for them skews yeah. back in the day. <laughs> just, just what, is, what, would, what, what is your hook to land ratio on those four to five pounders? It didn't seem like you lost very many fish at all. Like as a whole over the course of your career. I mean, if you hook a hundred four pound smallmouth, on a you know a little single hook deal and a spinning rod and i mean we're not talking like yeah. spy baits on four pound test six to eight pound test ten pound test drop shot hook flat worm something along that out of those hundred how many do you, well, do you expect to land it's saint it's saint Clair. my hookup ratio was close to 100 mm-hmm. um just because i was throwing that bigger hook and that's that's one reason i like i was throwing a little bit bigger bait um which you know, guys are throwing bigger baits on St. Clair. They eat bigger stuff. It's not a secret. But when you're threading, and and they were just just absolutely swallowing it, so that didn't that 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 helped. Um, but I was throwing a bigger bait, which allowed me to throw a bigger hook. I could jack on them pretty good, and um, I feel like the smaller, you know, and I, I wouldn't I wouldn't lose any with with it. Um, but when I'm, you know, you're throwing a little number one and number two drop shot hook you are going to lose fish but um that's for, why i really like that setup out there but you know at st lawrence you're not really throwing a bigger bait and a bigger hook so you know you're going to lose them but it's not you're going to lose a couple but i mean it's just like anything else i don't feel like if, if they're pinned good they can come up and jump as many times as they want um mm-hmm. but it's it's different out there you don't have the current stuff and um they're not as hard to to maybe get in on a you know the setup I was using. Yeah, Clay pointed that out too. So I, as I try to catch them up north here, uh, the last three years have started going smaller and smaller hooks. You're saying you think it's a better hook to land ratio with a bigger hook? Well, I was throwing a bigger hook. I was throwing a bigger bait. Just so your bait, throwing, yeah, yeah. I was throwing a, a you know a five inch. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a five inch max scent, the jerk shad, which is like a five big bait. Yeah. 
So I've done a two aught, done a two aught straight shank uh, robo hook, mm-hmm. and uh, you know threaded on there. And I mean, like I said, they were pretty much swallowing it. So, <laughs> you, but you put a smaller hook, and you know the fish are getting finickier. And then these fish weren't finicky at all. Uh, but if you go to some place where they are, yeah. You, I mean, it's just kind of one of those deals. I mean, you, you you swap hooks around and you catch a lot of fish and then you'll lose a couple. And But it's not like, yeah, I've never had an issue with smallmouth coming off, like a bad issue on a drop shot. Uh, we're going to kind of take a break after I get this last question uh, to, to knock it out. Obviously, ICAST 2023 coming up in Orlando. I mentioned at the beginning of the show, you're flying from Alabama. Uh, down to Orlando tomorrow. I'm up in New York, left my rig, uh, unhooked it, left it somewhere. I'm flying down tomorrow morning as well. Uh, is this the first time you've won just prior to going to ICAST? I know you've won a lot, but I'm trying to think of like the tournaments that you've won. I mean, within, you know, this is the last tournament prior to going to ICAST. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it, it is. It, that's got to be big for your career to be able to walk in there with your sponsors, representing your sponsors, talking to all the media, all the buyers, all the representatives are there and saying, well, this is what I, you know, this is what I did. This is what I did. I mean, is that, do you think you do get a little bit of extra pop winning before ICAST? And obviously there's a, there's a break kind of right there in July uh, with all the tours. It seems like probably the ideal week to win a major event if you're going to. Uh, Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, I was kind of thinking about that before going down. Um, you, you know, it, it couldn't really happen at a better time. I mean, you got – yeah, after ICAST, you know, you have one or one or two more tournaments, major tournaments, and then, you know, you get into, like, sponsor renewals and stuff like that. But, yeah, going into ICAST with a – you know, just winning an event, I feel like it's, it's definitely going to be pretty cool. Um, you know, and everybody – Everybody pretty much knows about it that's there, at least in the in, in, in our bass fishing industry. Um, so it is a big deal to uh, to lock one up just, just going in there. And, I mean, not saying it's going to, you know, be a life-changing deal, but it, it is really a great time to win an event going into that, uh, the, our biggest trade show. Um, so I, I am looking forward to that and um, – it was definitely a cool time to win. You've got a unique situation because you're, and you said the word life-changing experience happened so young in your career. And when you were so young that your entire career was ahead of those back-to-back classic wins. So there's a lot of guys who probably go to 10 or 15 ICAS and they're grinding it and they're working it. And then they win, uh, be it a red crest, be it a classic, be it an angler of the year. And then they get to see that change after they've grinded for 10 years. You kind of jumped in win, win and kind of took off from there. Is there anything at this point you think that you can win that would be a life changing event or are no. we talking like legacy wins now? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, yeah, it's there's... a weird question to answer. I mean, I, but yeah, it's I'm a not... valid question. Yeah, it's a valid question, I guess. I mean, I don't really, really like, like talking about it. Like, but there's nothing. Yeah, there's not an event now. I feel like I can win. It's gonna just be like, besides the money. Uh, I mean, it's still a lot of money. Whatever you look at, if it's mm-hmm. a classic or a red crest, I mean, that's the two biggest. Which is, I mean, yeah, that's that's still a lot of money that you can do something with. But yeah, there's not an event that I'm gonna win now that I'm gonna be like, man, this changed my career feel like it happened or i mean it obviously it happened early for me now it's just about different things in the industry like i mean or not in the industry but different things for me like you know my social presence and, and what i do with you know camera guys and do i do that do you, you know youtube how how you pretty much treat you know and, and going forward how you you adapt to everything that's changing with social media and, you know, you've seen a lot of guys bring camera guys out. Mm -hmm. Like that's really the thing for me that's, you know, that's different, I guess, especially after you, you you win something that's a big tournament you could do, but 
There's not Have a you thought about doing that? Have you thought about doing the full time camera guy? Yeah, I mean, I've thought about it. I bounced the idea around. Just it hadn't worked out for me. Like, what is next though? Because I mean, you can only have so many full time camera guys. Then you got sit. You know, you had one guy that was doing it. Then a couple. Then you take a different angles, and then it always seems like those angles are saturated. Like, what is? I'm I'm always trying to think like what one step ahead, and I'm trying to figure what is the next way to the next cool way to cover this that isn't hasn't already been done six different ways. Yeah. They're really, they're, I guess, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, yeah, the, the whole camera thing, camera guy, bringing a camera guy along and following everything. I, I think it's cool. I think some guys do a great mm-hmm. job with it. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I enjoy watching those tournaments from their, you know, from, from their side of things. Uh, you get to see a lot more behind the scenes stuff, which is cool, but I, I don't know. I mean, from an angler standpoint, it's it's hard to balance that. Like, is it worth it? That's that's always the question for an angler. Like, yeah. am I going to gain way more uh, sponsors from this? Am I going to do a better job for the sponsors if 50,000 people see this? Like, what, what's that turn into? And that's something you kind of got to balance out through your head. But it just hadn't been in the books for me yet. But, you know, at some point it could be. But. You know, I, I mean, I hadn't really seen, have seen the value of it to this point, but mm-hmm. it's out there. The value's there. It just depends on who you are. And, and then that's based on your sponsors, too, on what they see as valuable, too. So, like, you win, you win on, uh, you win on St. Clair. Walk me through, like, do you have sponsors calling you saying, hey, can you send me a 30 second deal on this? Can we do this? Can we got to work on this? Do they just call and say congratulations? Like, does that kind of depend based on like company and product on how they try to capitalize on a win? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really up to the angler and uh, on and, and the kind of the tournament scenario, right? Like where you win at what you went on is it a bait that somebody is it a bait that guys have won on already like i went on a bait i guess it's a not everybody has probably in the max scent line so i don't know how many got people have bought it or mm-hmm. how many they sold or what that even looks like when you win a tournament because granted a lot of terms i've won haven't haven't been on sponsor baits um mm-hmm. you know i've won on a little array of baits homemade and, yeah, homemade, homemade, homemade uh, competitors everything competitors yeah and they're cool with that like you don't get called into the office no. by the big dog and they're like dude like we're we're paying you money and you seriously just won this event on camera on a different bait like why the hell are you with us like if that's what like how does that go down no it goes down like that it I does mean, go down like that like you know like you're on the water smashing them going oh this is gonna suck next week because i'm gonna get a call from the man yep it's uh it's kind of frustrating and and i don't know i mean there's i haven't won that many events mm-hmm. but the ones that i've won on different products different not products different baits that has been something that goes through your mind and it goes through a lot of anglers minds mm-hmm. like when you're catching them, you're like, man, do I need to change to something, uh, sponsor bait to, you know, catch some fish on this. Um, that's gone through my mind, but a lot of times I'm like, no, I want to, I want to win. This is what I got confidence in and it, there may be something to it. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm just going to go with it. And, and, and if, if they say something, Hey, sorry. Um, but this one was a good win for me mentally and for sponsors because I was using everything and, and, okay. and I was confident in it and that's, I thought it was the deal and that's what I'm always going to do. And that's what a lot of anglers are going to do too. If they think it's the deal and they think they're confident in what they're using and it's going to catch them one more fish, it's going to land one more fish. It's worth it. Like I would rather win a tournament on a non-sponsored product than come in second and third and fourth fishing everything you're supposed to fish with because yeah you know granted that matters more yeah uh i will say i did have a co-angler at ufala who had he brought like four rods and half of them were jay lee signature series gray and yellow rods and i just said hey you like them he's like dude these things are freaking awesome he's like i love these things i was like okay cool that's cool yeah that's awesome 
Yeah, I'll have, to, I'll, have to, I'll have to get you on the. I'll have to get you on the team next. He was a co-angler at uh in one of the opens. Yeah. 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 He was cool. just get just he was actually just getting into tournament fishing. It's kind of a cool story. He was a. Uh, I think it was him. Yeah, because I didn't have one the other day. He was a uh, former uh, rock uh, lead singer of a heavy metal rock band. And he toured for like 15 years. Now he's got like a regular job and stuff. And he was like, dude, my buddy, like something happened where he couldn't. And he's like, I just got into this like two years ago. Cool. So we're sitting there and he's like, oh, that's cool. So it was it was cool, but it was also kind of messed up because he knew who Milliken was because I said hi to Milliken before yeah. the tournament started. And then I was like, hey, you see that? You see that uh, white boat over there with the BPS logo? I said, that's Rick Klon. And uh, he said, who? And I yeah. said, oh, we're going to have a history lesson. We're going to have a history lesson before we take off. <laughs> yeah, that hurts your feelings probably. Yeah, that's that hurts your feelings. You Dude, it was cool, though, to see Rick out there. It's like 100 degrees. It's like three days before the tournament starts, and he's just grinding a square bill on riprap with the big rim hat. Dude, he's yeah. got – like, he doesn't have to be out there in the opens yeah. on Lake Eufaula in Oklahoma in the end of June – like that's 105 crazy. degrees three days before the tournament. That's a dude who just loves to still fish. Yeah, no doubt. He loves tournaments for sure. All right. You want to talk weird stuff, uh, weird stuff or cool stuff or exciting stuff, but I like talking weird stuff. I cast when we come back and take our, take a break. Let's do it. All right. It's a uh, BTL semi on location. Yeah. I mean, we're at a location that's not the studio. So it's BTL on location. I'm in New York. Jordan is in Alabama, and we will be back right after this. The new Puma STS has been redesigned from the ground up. With the angler, design, function, and performance in mind, nothing on this new offering was compromised, and the only thing carried over from the previous version is the name. Based on the soft touch series hull that started with the flagship Jaguar, this new model is nimble and performs incredibly well at all speeds with either a 250 or 300 horsepower engine. Featuring a new 96 inch wide body footprint, this hull measures out at 20 foot 7 inches in length. Industry leading design coupled with tournament winning performance. The Puma STS from Basscat. Feel the rush. eating kind of man. And on behalf of all of those bigger, I gotta say it once and for all, it's bad enough that the fish look smaller in our hands. The last thing we should have to worry about is getting quality outdoor clothing that fits. Avco, any fish, any water. Elite Series Pro Daryl Gleason here. My Pro Guide batteries keep me going on those long tournament days and long practice days. Always plenty of juice, never fail. The best part about Pro Guide batteries, it's the people behind the company. They have over 40 years experience in the battery business, keeping all of us fishermen out on the water longer, catching more fish. Check them out at ProGuideBatteries.com. What's up, Bass Talk Live fans? Brandon Polinick here. And ever since I won a couple Bassmaster Elite Series events on X-Zone Lures, I've been getting a bunch of questions of what makes them so special and different. And really, the truth is, it's in the details. The little details, things like no cheap fillers in their plastic, that gives you more lifelike action, more realistic and vibrant colors. But don't just take my word for it. Go to www.xzonelures.com and check them out. Are you looking to install your own fishing electronics? The solution is the Bass Tank Power Harness. It takes the guesswork out of installation. No more voltage issues or interference. Designed by an engineer so that you can get professional results right there in your own garage. Installation done right with the help of the Bass Tank Power Harness. You can feel confident knowing that your installation was done right. The Bass Tank Power Harness. Give us a call or order yours today at thebasstank.com. Get the best patterns backed by tournament data. Start by finding the best 10% of your lake. 
know exactly what to look for and what to throw. After that, you just put them in the boat. Try the deep dive app today. Look at that beast right there. All right, welcome back. BTL on a Monday, a special lunch edition. We started the show with a fancy uh, DJI automated stand and headsets and different mics, and, and now we're back to normal audio with it propped on a single cup coffee maker. So, hey, that's how we roll. I know. I like it. You, you, you made it work. You, it's all about adapting, right? It's all about what's the worst thing that's ever happened to you on the water in a tournament, like logistically wise, where you were like outside of the classic win where you went and caught 27 pounds, but just like a total debacle of a day. Have you ever had one of those where you were just like, dude, this is I'm scared to even look at my own shadow. Oh, I've been pretty lucky with breakdowns and stuff like that. I mean, I remember, I don't know if it was in practice. It was in, I think it was in practice at the Chesapeake Bay. I beached my boat out on a sandbar. Yeah, it was, I think it was practice. And, and I had to get, like, Lucas or my brother. Like, I was stuck there for, you know, hours. <laughs> um, but in, in a tournament, like, is, is that what you're talking about? Like, breaking down or anything like that? A long ways off. I don't have any, like, crazy stories that I can remember. That was the one that comes to mind, though, because I was, like, absolutely beached. But uh, – I feel like as technology improves and cell phones and access and it, everything just gets better, there's less and less wild stories. Like, you know, if you sit down with like yeah. Mark Davis yeah. or any of those guys, Clark Wendland, any of those dudes, like they can just go on for hours about like times where they're like, and I'd still be out there if Jim hadn't driven by. Yeah. I, I towed a guy in that would still be out there one time on like you're on I was practicing, I think it was an open or something on St. Clair, and I went out to Huron, the mouth of the river, and I was like, saw this boat in the distance on Huron, and the dude was like waving his hands, and the wind was smoking, and I went out there, and he's like, dude, I broke down, and like, you know, he couldn't troll, mm -hmm. and I cell service was spotty, so... It was it was sketch. Like, I mean, I was like, dude, this dude would be, would have been out there. So I told him, like, you know, it took me a couple hours. But, um, yeah, he'd still be out there. All right, let's talk iCast, everyone's favorite thing. Do you have your opening line? Hey, guys, Jordan Lee here, iCast 2023, coming to you from the Berkeley booth. Want to talk to you about the new Maxent shapes. I mean, that's how it's going to go down. Uh, that's going to how it's going to go down. But I'm probably – man, I get tired of saying, hey – who I am at ICAST, yeah. I'm just I'm just gonna be like, look, here's a new bait out from Berkeley. Buy it, it if is. you want. Buy it if you want. I really don't care, but this is what it is. <laughs> Speaking of new stuff, uh, it seems like Berkeley comes out with new stuff every freaking day now. Yeah, bunch of new stuff at ICAST, and then do you have to do like homework to learn about all this stuff before you go, regardless of whether it's it's a pure fishing or in another sponsor or something like that. I mean, how do you know about this stuff when you go, or do you just get tossed in and you get a crash course right before the gates open? Yeah. I mean, most of the time I go there and I'm like, I've never seen this bait before. Like, yeah, I learn about it in the, in the, like they'll send me something, you know, like a week before and I may know about it, but like yeah. I've never thrown the bait, you know, mm -hmm. most of the time. So I'm kind of just checking it out when I'm there, uh, if it's something brand new. But there'll be there'll be something at Berkeley's booth that I haven't seen yet, probably. Can you remember any iCast where there was a bait that you just had to go see in person that you hadn't seen yet that you'd heard about? Because I mean, I vividly remember like scouring iCast to find the man's booth to see an Alabama rig for the first time. Yeah. Like, like the actual Alabama rig, because it was, everything was sold out. That happened in October with Elias. Then that was the next freaking July. But like all the ones I had seen, they were immediately sold out. I'd seen pictures of them, but to actually see the man's one was like six, seven months after the dang thing 
explode. Yeah. There's not, I can't remember anything, but I mean, most of the time, you know, I don't even get to like, I don't even get to walk around and see, see everything, but, um, there's probably been only a few baits. Like I'm sure the chatter bait was one of those type baits where, you know, guys saw it there at ICAST when they first came out with it. But most of the time it's, it, you don't like a, a, a bait that, there's, there's like all the live target stuff. Like I always back back in the heyday of the live target, I always made sure to go by the live target to see which animal they had molded into clear plastic. Yeah, I mean, I don't like go around searching that because I already know like what works and what doesn't. But there'll be something that I cast that'll probably be a bait that's good. But I mean, dude, now it's all Japanese stuff that comes out that with guys zero are- action. Yeah, like, I mean, that's what the, everything's turning into is, like, you know, Jap, Japan-based tackle, JDM stuff that's probably not even at ICAST that um, that everybody's just raving about, trying to get their hands on and all these glide baits. That, that's, you know, all these handmade glide baits that guys are wanting and trying to get, like, they're, they're not even going to be there at ICAST. So ICAST is just basically – uh just redoing different tackle for the most part. Like there's probably nothing there that's going to be like, I say there's nothing that's going to be there. that's going to wow me, but I'm not going to see it be like, wow, I can catch them on that bait. What's the last bait that did wow you? Um, the last bait that did wow me, <laughs> probably the, you know, like the, probably the depths that Sakamata shad, you know, guys that been throwing that, you know, shaking the jig head over the top of fish, something a little different. That, oh, will you tell, will you tell that story? Uh, what will me you and tell Jake? that story about shaking it with Jacob Wheeler, where I had, I was talking on the show about how Jacob had the different, different stuff. I mean, I'm going to tell it in a roundabout way, but you called and were like, dude, you're wrong on the show. It wasn't that he had secret spots; it's that he just outfished everybody with the. Yeah, I mean, bait. so like the the whole jig head minnow shaking it over, like basically glorified crappie fishing. You know, <laughs> I I knew about it like for a while now. Like Taku went with me a couple years back, and I mean, he caught some fish on it, but it was definitely like. Yeah, Jacob was fishing, you know, Gunnersville we're talking about. Yeah, like, where he won by a lot. Yeah, he won by a lot. Very and, easily. Yeah, and I mean, I, th- I threw that um, that bait, and, you know, I, I couldn't ever catch him on it. Like, Matt was throwing it. We couldn't catch him on it. And other guys were probably throwing it and couldn't catch him on it. And, you know, fishing some, some of the same spots as Jacob. But, I mean, how in tune he is with um, – just everything when it comes especially that's his wheelhouse is ledge fishing but i mean we pulled up on the exact same spot uh third day of the tournament fish had not had not been there that i knew about in practice they showed up there there was a big school fish there the day before that morning they were a little scattered out me and jake i pull up right behind jake i'm like dude i was coming here sorry I'm going to fish here with you. Is that, is that cool? Yeah, I don't – he's like, yeah, I don't care. So, I'm like, okay, well, I'm fixing to probably get smoked by Jacob here. And his first cast – I'm like, I'll give you first cast. They, he did not throw it out there uh, five seconds. Cooked up. I hadn't even made a cast yet. Like, I was literally waiting for him to make the first throw to see where he's going to throw so I didn't throw over him. He throws out there, hits the water, sinks probably – I mean, I'm fixing to cast. He's hooked up, and I just like – I don't even cast, obviously. I'm just sitting there. Like, most guys may have thrown in there right where he hooked one, but I'm, like, just watching him. Like, are you serious? Well, he gets it in. He's like, I don't think it's a bass. I don't think it's a bass. I'm like, yeah, whatever. It's going to be a seven-pounder. It's a drum. But the crazy – just sitting there fishing, you know, against him, like, on the same spot – just, you know, his different rotation of baits and and – him catching them on that bait, it just was, you know, he wasn't throwing the, the one I'm talking about, but he was throwing his own 
mm-hmm. you know, made it similar to that. That but, they're coming out with at iCast. <laughs> yeah, they're coming out with iCast, which, yeah, I, I don't know, man. It's just crazy. Like, he, he's just really – I mean, I, I can only get him to follow it. Um, they were following mine, you know, like crazy. And it's just so the, – the fishing has become so technical and – you have to have the right line, the right jig head. If you want to, like, win yeah. a big tournament, especially on pressured fish, like, everything has to be perfect jig head. He may not sound like, you know, he may not go into those details as much, but I promise you, like, everything has to be right and to, to get him to bite, especially on Gunnersville post-spawn. And, I mean, he just showed that to me. I mean, I was blown away. The places he was fishing, catching that kind of weight, you know, he just knows how to make them buy it. All right, back to iCast. Uh, so you'll go that whole show and won't walk around at least? I'll try to, but the, right now, I mean, I'll try to, but probably not. Yeah, I'll be in a booth somewhere. So, I, I mean, I'll walk past somewhere and maybe look, but, I mean, it's literally just, it's hard to, unless somebody says, hey, you got to go check this out. Like, I won't walk around. There's a, a number of different functions for ICAST. It's not open to the public. You have to be a media editorial, a buyer, someone in the industry uh, in order to go. It's not crazy hard to get, I mean, credentials for it. Uh, but it's not like you can't just show up and walk in. Uh, your primary reason for being there, though, do you ever talk to like the buyers and stuff where you're like, Hey man, you got to have this in your store or are there buyers that talk to you that say, do you think this would be good for my region? Or are you primarily there to do videos with media guys? Like, what would you say your role as an angler is at iCast? Yeah. So at iCast, it's different than other shows like the, the big rock show in uh, Nashville. They have that every year. I go to that. That's a lot of buyers come in and I, I'm more hands-on with the buyers, tell them, hey, you know, they have a store in Utah. I'm trying to figure out what they need, and I try mm-hmm. to help help them out on that. But at ICAST, it's more of uh, videos for, you know, media. So you're like the show pony there. You're the shiny guy that they put out out, out front. Yeah, you know, I mean, and, and honestly, I was talking with my, I was talking with Kristen about my wife, and I was like, you know, there's, What's weird about ICAST, man, I'm not saying it's not important, but, I mean, there's a couple main buyers, right? And some of them mm-hmm. probably aren't even there. Like, you got Tackle Warehouse. You have Bass Pro, which is probably a lot of, of these, uh, a lot of, you know, Berkeley and whoever, their biggest account. But I don't even think Bass Pro is there. It's a lot of smaller – I'm not saying they're not important, but it's smaller media that may not have the reach is – uh, a lot of the pro staff, let's say, influencers, things like that. To me, like when, especially during the COVID years, like we didn't go to ICAST, and which I know that was different because, co- you know, during COVID, sales spiked, people were fishing more. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I don't know, like it's, I, I kind of question to myself when I'm there and doing videos, like I don't ever see the videos again. I'm like where was this, what was this for? You know, like how many baits did this sell or how many people did this reach, you know? And so that's like, kind of goes through my mind there times, but I mean, it, it, I don't know. I mean, it is important, but um, could it be done virtually or could they just say, Hey, mm-hmm. all your post staff and all these influencers just post about this. And there's a lot of people are going to see it. Yeah, because, I mean, you've had a lot of signature series lines. Didn't you have a bunch of baits come out one year, like last year or two years ago, and then the Rod yeah. Reel lineup? And... Yeah, a few years back. It's been a while, but um, there's always a couple baits that, you know, pop out of ICAST. But, I mean, like the best in show, and, like, I know a lot of companies want to win that, the best, yeah. you know. But that's another thing. We've talked about this before. Like, okay, you win the best in show thing, but – can you show that that translates to any, because if you're outside the industry and you're a regular guy, like you, you don't even know what the hell iCast is. So you can promote that it got iCast best in show. But then the other thing that I find interesting is like 
a lot of the stuff, like, how do you have a best in show bait that no one's used? So you're going on looks then. Yeah. I mean, the thing could be a dud in the water. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. I mean, something when you, I mean, a spider could be when best in show. So, I mean, for like us. I've caught one on the spider. You haven't bought a Lunker Hunt spider at Walmart and said, I'm going to friggin' fish this thing till one. Don't lie to me. No, absolutely. You haven't done that? Absolutely. I went, I got a white one and a black, the ghost and the black widow. And I was like, I'm going to catch one on a spider just to catch one on a spider. Yeah. I mean, it was kind of cool, but uh, to win best in show, did that win best in show? I don't know. I remember one year a rock with a swivel in it did. Rocky, Rocky Brook Sinker, Stony Brook Sinkers. I always talk about it on the show, but it's literally a rock that they drill a hole in and then put a swivel in. So it was supposed to mask your drop shot. So now it's just a river rock rolling down. Yeah, that's pretty. That's a, I'm sure that thing's fire. I'm sure it <laughs> I don't know if they're still around. I think Stony Brook. Stony Rock, something like that. Sinkers. I think uh You I don't think, even know what size what so how do you know what size weight you're getting? They're all different. They they weigh them and put them in the package. No, they are. I mean, they are very sharp. I, if I remember correctly, Charlie Evans was a big proponent of those. Like mm. hey everybody, welcome so you back to our top shot rock mixed in with your quarter ounce rocks. Yeah. You just have yeah. a tackle box of rocks. You you've never seen that? Yeah, I, I think I've seen it. Yeah, I did see those. I didn't know that one best in show. Oh yeah, Yeti, the Yeti bucket one. See guys on the instant feedback, they they pay attention to what wins. Yeah. The Yeti bucket one best to show. Yeah. I'm pretty sure Berkeley won it last year with the Gilly. Yeah. yeah. And then there was a lot of a lot of people that were really upset over that because well, I mean, pretty much everything that you come over with this you can find because people don't realize that the mag draft is another version of another bait. Like the mag draft isn't the original. For Mega Bass, no. There's like another mag. There's another mag draft that was out before the mag draft. Oh, but yeah. But then you copy that, and everybody's like, "Oh, it's a mag draft." But no one looks at the mag draft and says, "Oh, it's a whatever was before that." Yeah, it's just because what well, was popular. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know. I kind of question that, and I don't know. There's things about iCast that I just don't understand. I just think about you go to iCast, you see all these companies there. I'm I'm curious to know what companies don't go to iCast, but uh, like you just see what all the money that's spent at yeah. iCast, and you're like, man, like what could these companies do with the money and put it putting it elsewhere oh, elsewhere to translate that into sales? Like sometimes I just think about that, and I'm like, but dude, uh, in that same breath, it is nice to get everybody in the in the same spot. Oh yeah, with the baits there in their hands. You get to go to dinner with the guys that you know. It's important. It, it's a big wheel that works, and everybody kind of has their spot in it. And you get to kind of meet the guys, the developers, and right. the money maker guys, and then you're the angler guys and the media guys, and it just kind of yeah. brings everybody together. Uh, and, and you know, they have the state of the industry breakfast, and uh. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of, of deal. there's a lot of there's a lot of in, so it's in person so i think I, yeah i mean you're you're totally right like i'm not saying iCast is just you know, no i mean there's certain in. aspects you know and especially of you i mean you're not a huge people person let's be honest like you'd rather be out on the lake fishing or hanging out with the family well, you're not like oh lots of people let's go yeah yeah i guess you're right on that on that sense of thing but it is important to have everybody there mm-hmm. and to be under one roof and like you know there is deals that happen there especially for the the companies that that are important um but yeah i mean i'm looking forward to it i think we got some cool stuff coming out um which i mean that i think the guys at at berkeley um doing a good job of coming out with baits that we're able to fish with and so I'm looking forward to that, which is I think that's every company. I mean, I'm I'm curious to see what else is coming out that I'm uh that I'll probably end up buying. That'll work. Anything else? What time you fly out to when you got one of those early morning flights? I was smart, I don't fly out till noon. Yeah, I think I fly in at, at five in the evening. Oh, okay. So you're just there, yeah. you're in there for Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Yeah, when is the first day of the show actually 
I think they've got some stuff that kicks off on Tuesday, like some yeah. fishing That's tournaments and then the on the water stuff. Did well, you ever? Fish. What's that? I've never fished the tournament. Yeah, neither have I. Are you? Uh, what what booster are you going to be at? Big I'm, Bop dude, I'm going with BTL. Like, I mean, I'm, I got to. You know, that's how the show, that's how I make my living is through the sponsorship yeah. with the with the show because it sure as hell isn't fishing the opens. So or, are you going to be like, so at BTL, so you're going to be like setting up sponsorship deals down there? Y'all going to have a booth or like, what do y'all? No, 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 not booths. So, I mean, I'll, I'll be going around as editorial content to where, you know, I'll, I'll spend time looking for things that I think would be good, good content for BTL, uh, whether it's an interesting story from a guy who has a booth there a new bait, existing baits, current trends in the industry, the best of shows, setting up uh, interviews, things like that. Like that, that's the lion's share of why I'm there. I mean, that's what my, my badge is, Bass Talk Live editorial, media editorial content. Uh, and then and then also, uh, you know, looking to 2024, because what a lot of people don't realize is a lot of those budgets and schedules are set uh, now. Yeah, uh, this is where they start kind of getting a picture of what the year looks like, and this is, I think it's an interesting year this year. See if you agree, is you know, with that that COVID spike, a positive spike in fishing sales, um, it's kind of getting back to where it had been before that, and we saw that the last last year and a half. Yeah. Too. So now it's very interesting going forward. Plus, there's a lot of of major deals and and changes and big money and a lot of stuff that's way above my pay grade or understanding that's going on right now in the industry too. So I, I think this could be a, a pretty interesting year. Yeah. Well, I need to talk to you off, off record to hear about these, all these big money deals and stuff. Hey, one more thing before you let me go. Um, give me a, give me a recap, a quick recap on, uh, on Onada. Cause I've never fished there. I, I, I talked to you before the deal. You said you've been up there fishing doing the, the, yeah. Kit. Was it was the fishing good? Yeah, dude. Oneida's really come back. I always, you know, when I covered Oneida, I always remember the uh, Angler of the Year race that Todd Faircloth kind of had a, a stranglehold on and came to Oneida, and I think he caught like three for seven pounds each day. Yeah. Uh, I remember Chad Griffin catching yeah. him on, on a pop pound fluorocarbon on a Zell pop. On the pop uh, on 20 pound fluoro. Yeah, I remember uh, Yusuke Miyazaki just hooking one and just hollering every time it jumped. Oh, when it jumped, because, I mean, it was up and down. But back then it was, uh, uh, well, obviously with what Biffle had done and then Rojas and Steve Kennedy as well, the largemouth were real uh, were real prevalent. Uh, Biffle in 06, I think it was either 06 or 07, I think it was 06, kind of showed everybody that you could flip, power flip shallow. Then you had Kennedy with the Cinco, uh, Rojas with the Pop and Frog, and then guys were punching the the grass. But you're talking 15 to 17 pounds. Really, the only uh, the only serious contender for smallmouth back then was when Jeff Creek finished second, and he was fishing a, a tube open water for schooling smallies. But the smallies just weren't big enough to to contend. Uh, well, they got through the canal, and they're in a lake now, and they've been in the lake for the last four or five years. Then I think six or seven years ago, they had a fish kill. No, they the fish kill happened when the gobies came in. There's a bunch of different theories. I've been talking to locals about what happened. But pretty much uh, a, a lot of fish, a lot of the largemouth, a lot of the shallow fish died. Uh, and it sucked for a number of years. And now it's coming back. There's really good vegetation in it. There's a, just a, an abundance of forage, gobies. Uh, there's American shad in here now. Uh that have been here for four or five years. There's actually a uh, blueback herring, not, not very cool. many of them, but those Frank Scalish did a thing about blueback. And I'm like, yeah, dude, you're wrong on that. And I started doing some research and found some research projects on blueback herring that are coming through, through like on a dog through the canal, through the lock and dam. They're going to have like herring baits, make it up there. Like they do it like Lanier. You're going to see out there guys. Yeah. You know, those on. were kind of older. There's always been some bluebacks in there. Uh, and I, I know the guys at Oneida are going to slaughter me that I get this recap wrong, but I feel like yeah. I kind of understand it. But you. the goby eaters, so the smallmouth have done the same thing on Oneida that they've done on Champlain. They've gotten out there, and they just are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, a quarter pound a year. So yeah. what was a two and three quarter is was then is a three. And now, I mean, I think I probably caught 100 total over the 
five days that I was out there. So, I mean, it's not like every cast, but it's good ones. And I think I had four that were under two pounds and 90% of them were three and a quarter to four pounds. Now in the entire camp, there wasn't a five pounder caught. There was like a 489. So we're not talking giants, but I mean, just those, those freaking good quality small, you can catch them from a pop bar to a flatworm to dragon sounds like Shane net, kind of. yeah jerk bait spinner bait crank bait you can do a tube you can do it in six inches and sight fish them on rock and grass you can go out deep and drop shot them you can do whatever you want that's cool it, it's a cool lake man when you're driving past it one time you know you pass pass over that highway and you look you know you look to your left and there's that matted grass we'll probably stuff. go there at some point i mean i don't i don't know why we have it but it's a it's a really really cool like it's not good for an open when you've got 250 boats it's an absolute disaster uh with that really? many, and that much pressure on it because it doesn't get any pressure but like i mean right now there's like five boats on the lake probably yeah and there will be the whole week so that's awesome yeah no it's a it's it's one of those cool lakes you, do you have like any of those lakes where like when you launch you just like find yourself you've got kind of like a little bit of a grin on your face yeah. as you idle out and it just oh, feels yeah. different like what are those lakes for you I mean, I don't know. I mean, Champlain's one of those lakes where you you dump in and you go out and you know, like, you're probably going to go at some point. Mm -hmm. You're going to find a wad of fish and see something really cool. You know, like, that's one lake that I'm always thinking that, you know, you don't know if you're going to catch them on top water or, you know, drop shot or flipping or what. But, you know, it's just such a good lake. Um that's one lake to me that I just, you know, love to launch the boat at. You just fired up to go out there in on a <laughs> Wednesday and nobody's out there and no tournament and you're just wanting to just go whack them. It's pretty cool. It is. And then, I mean, are you like that with Gunnersville or do you get tired of Gunnersville? I don't really go out there as much as I used to. And it probably showed in our tournament, you know, it's kind of disappointing growing up on a lake but man it changed so much and it's not the same like oh if you got the spot you're going to catch them how Mm -hmm. it used to be it's you have you have to have the spot and you have to have the right bait and you have to be there at the right time to to catch a a big stringer and so it's not just pull up and throw a 10 xd or throw a whatever that we used to throw like and just catch 20 fish at a time it's just different now so but i mean i like i like different times of year at gunnersville just not maybe not the middle of the summer but pre-spawn trapping stuff like that and i get fired up with that it's good stuff all right well i'm gonna let you go dude i greatly appreciate it like i said i know you had would you have a home inspection this morning (laughs) like a growth you had some I I i had a dude coming in uh it was a contractor. Okay. You had a grown up remodel. Yeah. Remodel deal. And then Baker's running around just being absolutely going berserk. So he's down for a nap right now. Yeah. He's down for a nap. He'll be up. How long long does that last? Uh, probably not much longer. Is he, is he like you, like you remind you of yourself as a little kid or I I don't remember when I was, I know, but do people say like, Oh, it's like you or is is he a, more energetic yeah he may be a little more energetic yeah that's exciting good for you yeah. enjoy that. i will don't worry all right i'll see you at icast i'll see you down there buddy thanks all right, see you all right that is uh jordan lee We're gonna take our final break of the show when we come back talk a little bit about what we have going on this week what we have going on from icast uh and wrap things up btl on a monday july 10th We'll be back right after this. Have you considered purchasing new electronics for your rig? The type of mounts you choose to protect your investment should be part of the decision-making process. No matter if you prefer one, two, or three graphs up front, Beatdown Outdoors has a solution for you. Adjustable, versatile, rigid, and made in the USA. What's your ultimate electronic setup? Check out the full selection of Beatdown Outdoors products by visiting BeatdownOutdoors.com. The great thing about the new Sensation Soft Plastics from Big Bite Baits, heavily scented, super soft, buoyant, comes in seven great new shapes. I've got a couple of them of my signature series, the Cliffhanger Worm and the Ramtail Craw, great for a flipping jig, 
football jig, swim jig, all that. Several other great shapes. Really excited about it. We've worked over the last year. Catches fish all over the country. And I think it's gonna catch fish for people everywhere you try it. The Spro Little John crankbait has been around for almost 15 years and it is one of my go-to crankbaits whenever I need a fish in the boat. So you can never have enough new colors. That's why Spro is coming out with a handful of new colors, including Pearl Shad, which has this bleached out white look, but it's got this pearlescent, really, really pretty. We've got Copper Shad, which looks amazing in the water. It's got that purple flake on the back, really, really pops in the water. And then if you want some real pop, we've got Sparkle Shad, nothing but sparkles all over this thing. And then last but not least, we've got the matte sexy shad just a really different looking color for a crankbait so you want to give them a little different look that matte sexy shad is definitely the one to go with all these colors are available in the original little john and the md all right we are back wrapping things up on a monday I want to give a shout out to jordan lee for jumping on uh, not exactly sure what the ICAST schedule is going to be. Uh, I'm going to try to do two live shows from ICAST. Uh, and then next week, uh, we'll be doing live shows from the St. Lawrence River. I have a little cool setup where I'm staying, what I'm doing. So I should have good internet service, should have, uh, should have, should be good to go during that. If you have won a prize pack over the past couple of months, all of those are out in the mail. Uh, the Chad Shad, the X Zone. Uh, plastics, all that stuff is out uh, and greatly appreciate the feedback. So thanks for jumping on. We had really good uh, viewer participation and numbers for a little bit of a different time, a noon show. So stay tuned to BassZone.com uh, and also my Instagram, just at Matt Pengrack uh, for an update on when we will have new BTLs. But from New York, that's all we got. We'll see you guys. Not tomorrow because we're going to be flying tomorrow and then actually have a uh, conference call uh, about some really cool stuff that's going down on day four that Frank and I will be able to talk about in the near future. Uh, but hopefully on Wednesday, uh, the first day ICAST will have a live show. So stay tuned. Like I said, BassZone.com, uh, just that main moniker there. I'll show you uh, what time it'll be at. So that's all we got. Thanks for take tuning in. We'll see everybody Wednesday later.